we began our trip in Reykjavik, Iceland. The first thing that we saw in Reykjavik was the Catholic Cathedral there, and we got there really early in the morning, and they were having adoration in the church. When we were there, we saw this statue of uh, the Madonna and baby Jesus. It's from the 14th century. As we walked around Reykjavik, it was very, very cold. We were underdressed for the occasion, but it was also very beautiful. And here's a menu of some of the Icelandic food. Please note some of the must-try items of their favorite foods. Minky whale, smoked puffin, and up above, filet of Icelandic foal. We were trying to stay warm in Reykjavik with a cup of coffee. But Patrick and I weren't really succeeding, so we just went over and took pictures with this little Viking troll that it was outside of one of the shops. Here's a sculpture of a Viking ship in Reykjavik. And here is us standing next to the Viking ship. And when we went out by the Viking ship, it was so cold. We literally only had a few seconds to take these pictures before Mommy wanted to get back in the car because it was so cold. This is a Lutheran church in Iceland, and it's really famous because the architecture makes it look like the front of a Viking ship. This is the inside of that church. And here we went up to the top of the church, and here's the view from the top. It was pretty amazing. You could see in all four directions, and you could see just beautiful landscapes, the ocean. You could see the mountains. It was really spectacular. Outside of the church, there's a statue of Leif Erikson that was presented to the people of Iceland by the United States. And here is David and Claire and Patrick near the statue. And here's Claire and I in a shop trying on Viking hats. Mommy decided she wanted to be a Viking as well, but uh, she didn't have the hat on. So Patrick and I were at the visitor center and we were looking at the map of Iceland and just seeing how small their country is. This was a restaurant that we ate at in Reykjavik. It had excellent food, and David was being artistic with the picture here of Patrick in the glass. And Patrick, you weren't really in that wine glass, were you? No. Well, that was pretty much what happened during our about 11 or 12 hours that we had as a layover in Reykjavik, Iceland. Then we got back on the plane and headed to our next destination. Madrid, Spain. This is a view of the church that we attended Mass at on that Sunday, and it was just a gorgeous church. This is the crucifix that hangs in the church, and it's, it's gorgeous. And here is the, just the whole inside of the church. Some people refer to this as what, Margaret? Some people refer to it as the Sistine Chapel of Spain. And they're in the process of converting it, apparently, from a church into a museum because it's so spectacular. Then we walked around Madrid. This was the Madrid City Hall. And here is um, me, Claire, and my mom outside of the Prado. And what is the Prado, Margaret? The Prado is one of the most famous art museums in the world. It was spectacular. Unfortunately, we couldn't take pictures inside the Prado Museum but afterward we looked back at it. This is in a very famous square in Madrid. It's called um, Puerta de Sol, and here we are enjoying the square. And this is us with a famous statue of a bear eating uh, strawberries off of a tree. And here is my sister and I sitting by a fountain. We continued to wander all around Madrid seeing all kinds of beautiful sights. This is a famous square called the Plaza de Mayor. This is also a great restaurant that we uh, ate at called El Botin. And El Botin is the oldest restaurant in the world that's still in operation. So this is the Guinness World Records certificate of um, saying that it's the oldest restaurant. And Margaret, who is uh, famous for having eaten at El Botin besides Ernest. us? Ernest Hemingway ate there, and actually he talks about the restaurant and the suckling pig in his book, The Sun Also Rises. And Patrick, who of our family ate the suckling pig while we were there? My dad. Yeah. This is us outside the restaurant on a stairway in the streets of Madrid. And right next to El Botin, there was a restaurant that had this sign hanging up. And so my dad and I thought that was really clever, and we kind of wanted to go there to support them for their awesome sign. So this is Claire and Patrick enjoying Madrid at night. 
And then the next morning, we went out to join the 40 Days for Life leader in Madrid, Frank. And that's him in the back with the 40 Days for Life hat on. And that picture was actually taken outside of the abortion facility where they hold their 40 Days for Life. They pray outside of that facility, which is located right next door to this church. And uh, that's where they go and pray for 40 days. And they've done multiple campaigns there. While we were walking around Madrid, we went to the oldest um, hot chocolate store in Madrid. So this is us eating our churros with hot chocolate. And this is us with um, the 40 Days for Life leader and another really nice man outside of the chocolate store. And here's Claire and I next to a huge swordfish in the in a tapas market in um, the San Miguel market in Madrid. And this is me with the other gentleman that Claire was referencing. That's Miguel, and he works with a Spanish organization, very supportive of 40 Days for Life. So he was a lot of fun to be with. Here's the San Miguel Market. It was just bustling with people at lunchtime. Right after we went uh, to lunch, we went to the cathedral there to sightsee. And this is a statue of Pope John Paul outside of the cathedral. It was a big cathedral, very modern, but also had very uh, historic architecture as well. Very, very pretty. And the altar had lots of beautiful paintings and sculptures on it. Here are Claire and Patrick outside of the cathedral. And the cathedral, outside of the cathedral, there's a huge square. So this is the view of the cathedral from the square. And Patrick, what's on the other side of the Across square? Across from um, the, uh, the cathedral is the royal palace and the king... Queen of Spain don't actually live there anymore, but it's where they all, every, all the kings used to live. So we got a tour through the royal palace uh, right after we had gone to the cathedral. Now they wouldn't let us take pictures inside the uh, royal palace, but we did get to pick, take pictures of some of the other guests who were visiting. So here we are standing right outside of the royal palace. And here is our whole family outside of the palace. And from there, we continued wandering around Madrid and getting to see some of the beautiful flowers and architecture and statues. And we also walked through some really bustling market streets on our way back to our hotel. And this is actually the church where uh, there was a prayer vigil that was held. And these people here with us are all involved in the 40 Days for Life in Madrid. They were just lovely people. And after the prayer vigil, we went out and just uh, got to spend social time with them in their courtyard there. And literally, that's right across the street from where that abortion facility is. And after we did that, we went to dinner off of the Plaza Mayor. So here's Patrick and I at our restaurant there. Well, then it was time for us to be done in Madrid and get ready for our big adventure. This is in the train station in Madrid. And you can see Patrick's got his backpack on, ready to hike the Camino. So we rode the train for six hours from Madrid to the town of Saria, and that was our starting point on the Camino de Santiago, or the Way of St. James. Now, there are many different routes that different people take on the Camino, and one of the most traveled routes is the French route, which begins in the French Pyrenees Mountains and is usually like a five-week walk all the way to Santiago de Compostela. But to actually be certified as walking the Camino, you have to do at least 100 kilometers. And so where we were starting here in Saria was 115 kilometers from Santiago. And here is us the next morning starting out quite early. And while it was still really early, we crossed over this pretty little bridge over a little creek. Here we are going up the streets of Saria to walk the way. And here's the view looking back over our shoulders, looking back at Saria, a beautiful little town and a great starting point for us. Started off really cool in the morning, but then as the day went on, it got warmer and warmer. And as you can see, we don't have our coats on because it got warmer and so we're walking down the way. Here we are on a little uh, brick pathway and it's just beautiful. And here's us walking out on a path somewhere in the country in Spain. When we started off that morning, there were numerous other pilgrims with us. And at times we would be alone. And at times we would have other people walking with us through the beautiful countryside. And sometimes we'd meet new friends along the way. And here I met this horse when we took a little rest break. So I was really excited to see it and pet it. And here we are walking down the path. And continuing to walk. This was so great because as we were walking, 
<clears throat> there was a man with all his cows, so we got to walk in between his cows down the Camino. I think they were pilgrims as well. I think so. <laughs> and here's us crossing a little stream that was going across our path. And just the beautiful scenery of northern Spain. All along the way, there were different little churches, some little, some big, and we would stop at many of them, and that was one of the churches. These are our backpacks with our shell. The shell represents a pilgrim, and on our shells is the cross of St. James. And here we are smiling as my mom takes a picture on the Camino. And this was the end of our day. We were coming into the little town of Porto Marin, which was going to be our first night on the Camino. And we headed into the town. We were there mid-afternoon. We had a few hours to enjoy, and uh, we changed clothes and relaxed a little bit. And then that evening, we went to uh, Mass at the local church in the middle of the town. It had a sculpture of St. James, so the kids enjoyed that. And this was right after the Pilgrim Mass, which they have every day in the evening where all the pilgrims go to Mass together. And here is us eating at a restaurant with a nice view of the river. It was a beautiful town, probably the prettiest of the stopping points we had along the way. And at almost all the restaurants in Spain, it seemed that I always get, got meat because I love meat. There's always cured hams and sausages and salamis and cheeses. Mm -hmm. Now who's that, Patrick? Um, that is on Claire's Pizza Box. I'm, I'm imitating the guy below the chef. So that was the end of day one, and then we were ready for our second day on the Camino de Santiago. So we started off that morning. It was very, very cold that morning. So we have our jackets on, and here we are walking near the river. It's just a beautiful, beautiful scenery. And the first thing we did that morning was we walked across the bridge to... Um, get on to another path that was heading out the way that we were supposed to go. And while walking down that path, we noticed many of these huge slugs. They were really big. They were probably, yes. what, five or six inches long or bigger. And at one of our rest stops, there were a bunch of little kittens running around and climbing in trees everywhere, and they were adorable. So while Claire and Patrick were enjoying the kittens, Mommy and Daddy were enjoying some really good Spanish coffee. And yeah, I am here treating my feet and my blisters with what uh, we found in Spain. It's called Compede. You can't buy it in the United States, but it's like gold when you're on the Camino. And this is us going through a little town that was on the Camino. And you can see in the back um, behind us, there's a crossing, a cow crossing sign. And this you can't really tell, but it was a big uphill that we were working up and we were getting really tired by this point. So here we are walking through a field. Uh, it was just so lovely and peaceful. And this is me at uh, one of our little stops, just resting my feet and sitting down. And Claire did not put all the graffiti on the sign there. <laughs> and this was the view looking out over the landscape. And here we are at a rest stop that was very needed. And we are resting in some hammocks while my dad takes pictures of us. And while we were at the rest stop, a, another group of cows came through the town, and some guy was taking a selfie with the cows. <laughs> hmm. So here's Claire as she's walking. We, this is when we left the rest stop. Here's Patrick, and we're going on our way. So by the end of the second day, we were pretty exhausted. That was when the pain in our feet first started to really set in. And we found a very much needed rest stop with ice cream at the end of the day. And I will tell you, it was a lifesaver. This is just another gorgeous view, the Camino. And that was what took us into our destination of the evening, Palace de Rey, where we ended day two. We began our day in Palace de Rey pretty early, and it was still quite cold. And we walked through the town, past the church and down some streets. And then we walked onto a little natural wooded path and um, we stopped at a little quaint village that, to take pictures in because it was really cute. And as the sun was rising, our shadows were really long, but we were still enjoying it. It's such a cute picture of Claire and Patrick. They were such troopers on the Camino. And here's just a beautiful shot. There were flowers everywhere. And here we are, my mom drinking coffee and 
me eating ice cream. And I needed some ice cream too, so I got some. You'll start to see a recurring theme as we walk the Camino that lots of rest stops were needed. I think the ice cream was the second most important thing to helping with our blisters only after the compede that Margaret mentioned earlier. This was a really important moment for us because it marked for us the halfway point of the stretch that we were walking. And all along the Camino, you would see signs with the shell and you would also see those yellow arrows like the sign there. And those yellow arrows would tell you the way to go. And literally, we never needed a map the entire way. You just follow those arrows, whether they're on signs, whether they're painted on buildings or on the road. But that was our halfway point. So we knew from there it would only get easier. And here is... Claire and I, Claire petting or looking at a cat and I poking my head into some hut, hut thing or I don't know. Nothing came out and bit you though, right? No. Okay, good. I love this picture. Patrick and I are holding hands as we walk the Camino. These are two men that we met, wonderful young men from Slovakia. And they did speak um, pretty good English, so we were able to talk with them for a while. They were just great guys. And here we are entering the town of Malid, which is a moderate town, and it's famous for its octopus. And we stopped in the little church there and looked around it. And then we kept walking into the town. Little did we know what site would be uh, ahead of us as we walked into Malid. But this man walking his donkey with a dog on its back. And you have to note on the head of the donkey also, it does have the Camino shell, so it must be a pilgrim. We thought this was just totally ironic and just a, a beautiful example of the kind of culture there in Spain. I love this picture because David was so brave. He ate octopus. <laughs> Here's the octopus, and it, the menu right there tells you how much it was and it was just, uh, it was an interesting, I had a little bite of David's. It was very interesting. And every family member did try it. I was very impressed. Yes. And after my dad had finished with his octopus, we decided to see if the suction cup still stuck to the wine glass, which it did. After our interesting lunch, <laughs> we um, rested in a, a grassy spot and took off our shoes and put compete on our feet. <laughs> Got ready for more walking. So here we are about to start off again from the lead. And walking through just the beautiful scenery. Uh, it was interesting, all the different terrains. Sometimes like this, you'd be on a gravel trail. Other times on the side of a road. Sometimes in the, in the woods. And we stopped in another little church in some little village. This was really great. We met this woman from South Africa, and you can see um, her backpacking. So here we are walking with her again. She had flags from all over the places she's hiked in. And here's Claire and I resting on a log. <laughs> Did you need that rest? Yes. And when we were going through another town, we were really hot, so we splashed our hands around in a water fountain. And then when we got to another town, it was time for another rest. After our rest, we kept on going on the way. And then we were heading into our destination that evening. We had arrived in Arthua. The Z in the name is pronounced Th. And we were staying there, and that was the final hill heading up to where we were staying. And all over on the Camino route, they have these little hut things. And we're not exactly sure what they are, but we think they might be a little chapel of some sort. These are some flowers on the grounds where we stayed that night. It was just gorgeous. And here we are that morning. And here's the inside of Claire and I's room. They were really cool. And that finished our day there in Arthua and got us ready to head out on day four. So here we are leaving, and uh, I was still a little bit chilly that morning, but it was definitely warming up as the days went on. It was also reassuring to know that the day before had been our longest day, and this day was definitely uh, notably shorter. The day before had been about 20 miles, yes. and this day we were going to do about 13. That's right. And here am I saying hello to some cows. And here's me on the path walking. And our beautiful children as we walk the Camino. And this picture was really neat, the panoramic view, because you can see there on the left, Margaret, Claire, and Patrick, and then you can see the cornfields and the rolling hills of northern Spain. So here's Claire, and you can see, uh, David talked about earlier how um, the Camino is very well marked. So there's the yellow arrow that symbolizes you're on the Camino. 
And at our first rest stop, um, there was a group of Spanish scouts. And there was also these two guys who'd been walking the Camino with a guitar and a radio. And the guy started playing a song on the guitar and all the kids were singing with him. And we continued on following the yellow arrows and walking through the woods. This was a Coke machine. We thought this was really cool because it shows you uh, the route that we were on to reach our destination, Santiago. And as we walked away from that one rest stop, there had been a bunch of bottles left on the wall and just thought it was uh, really indicative of how hot it can get as you're walking on the Camino. And here we are crossing a bridge again. And here's some cactus on the side of one of the homes. Some people did ride bikes, and here's a bicycle built for two, which I think that was the only one like that that we saw. It was cute. When we were walking into another town, they have all the mass times on their road signs, and we thought that was really cool. We had to wash our clothes, and um, so Claire and I are hand washing the clothes, and then we will put them on a line to dry. And then that night we went to a pilgrim mass, and every town would have some sort of a pilgrim mass in the evening at a local church. And here in this church, the, at the end of the mass, they invited all of the pilgrims, the people walking the Camino, to come up onto the altar for a blessing. And it was really neat, but also the group across the other side of the altar there in the blue shirts was a group that was walking the Camino from Arizona. And some of them were students from Franciscan University and others, and we had walked with them for several of the days. So it was really neat to get to have that experience with them. And besides the parish priest there in the green vestments, the other priest there on the right was a priest that was walking with the uh, Arizona group. And here's a view of some of the different pilgrims. And you can see the church, and it has that shell in the background behind the altar, which was really neat. This is me stamping our credentials. So everywhere we went, um, each place would have a stamp, and you had to get at least two stamps per day. So that's what I'm doing at the church there. And you saw earlier when we were washing our clothes, and that night they hung outside to dry. There were no dryers anywhere that we encountered in Spain. We would always have to hang our clothes out to dry. But uh, because we had everything on our back, we would wash clothes every couple days and be ready to go. And that was the end of day four on the Camino de Santiago. And here um, is these two guys walking down the street. They had played the music previously at the cafe. And here's us about to get started on our last day on the Camino. And heading out into the woods on the last day and walking the roads. <laughs> here's a picture of my foot with one of my mini blisters and I have a band-aid on it, which was helpful. <laughs> and Claire and Patrick resting at yet another rest stop. The next picture is one that was uh, a little misleading because we came across this statue along the side of the road saying Santiago, and that was, of course, our destination, the town of Santiago de Compostela. And so we thought, wow, we're really close to the town, and little did we know we weren't really that close. So we still had a ways to go, so it was important that we took another break. And we passed churches and signs that said Camino de Santiago. Here are Claire and Patrick walking on a country road. And while we were walking down the path, there was a sign on the post that said Virginia is for lovers. And you didn't put it there. No, we didn't. <laughs> and here are some eucalyptus trees. And there was eucalyptus trees all across um, Galicia, which is, north which is the province we were in in northern Spain. And here was one of the many hills we went up that day. It was a pretty grueling one, and you can tell from Patrick's expression, <laughs> it's rather painful. Even the bikers can't pedal up that one. They're having to walk up the hill. But once we got to the top, time for another break. And so after the break, we kept walking for our final stretch into Santiago. We were really blessed because it didn't rain on us. It rains a lot there. And here's a memorial um, to St. Uh, John Paul the Great, because this is where he actually started walking the way when he went as Pope. And then it was continuing on into Santiago. And here is us standing outside of the city of Santiago de Compostela. And Patrick, what were we right near at that spot? That sign, I don't know if you can see, it's on the left. It said... Los Abetos, and that was our hotel, and we were like, oh, and we had to walk right by our hotel. Yep, and we still had to go a ways past mm -hmm. it and then come to back the to the cathedral. It. And so here's me crossing the bridge over the major highway into Santiago, and to show you that you're on the right path, they have all the little scallops on the ground. 
And here's Claire and I walking through Santiago. So we're almost there, and this is actually right outside of the cathedral there in Santiago. And we're making those final steps, and then we arrived at the side of the cathedral. We didn't at first see the front of it, and so we went into the side of the cathedral. And here in the cathedral, they have a marker uh, commemorating the visits of Pope Benedict and Pope John Paul. And here is the inside of the cathedral, which is really beautiful. Another view of the cathedral. It's just huge, mm. too. Massive. Very ornate. And then when we went out the main side to view the church, we found that it was completely under construction. And so even though we didn't see it in its normal form, at least they were kind enough to put a picture on one side so we knew what it should look like. I really like this picture of Claire and I. We were so excited. There's Patrick to all be sitting. <laughs> and here's the, the Cathedral of Santiago in the background. And here is more of the inside. And as you can see, um, there's a string hanging. And hanging from that string is the thurible, which is this huge incense. Um, dispenser. Dispenser. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Boda Fumero. Yeah. And it's one of the largest in the entire world. You'll see more of that later. It's a beautiful church. This is so cute. So this is Patrick with his certificate. It's written in Latin saying that he walked the Camino de Santiago. And these are all of our shoes at the end with our stamp credentials and our Camino certificate saying that we finished it and some very well-worn shoes that had uh, experienced a lot mm -hmm. of blisters along the way. So that was the end of our Camino journey, but we still spent a little bit more time in Santiago de Compostela in Spain, including time where we were able to go back and visit the cathedral more and spend more time exploring the town. This is uh, the organ in the cathedral. And here we are with this lady that we had met along the way. She was from Germany and she had walked the entire Camino in five weeks. And so it was really emotional for her being at Santiago on her last day. And this was at the Pilgrim Mass on that day. It was a Monday. And every day at noon, they have a Mass specifically for the pilgrims who are arriving. And since the day before we had arrived later in the afternoon, this was the Pilgrim Mass that we went to. We were both surprised and blessed at that pilgrim mass to witness the swinging of the Bodo Fumero, that incense thurible. Much of the year, the Bodo Fumero is actually kept in the cathedral's library and is out for public display, but not hanging in the church. So it was surprising enough that it was hanging in the church, but to get and to witness them swinging this giant incense thurible was an absolutely amazing sight. Exploring the cathedral and going to Mass, we went to a restaurant that was really good. And in the restaurant, there were all these holes with glass over it. So I stood on one and we took a picture. And we all stood on it then and took a picture. So here are Claire and Patrick uh, right near the cathedral in the square there. And this is a really famous pillar right inside the door. And pilgrims used to rub it when they would walk in, but now since it's so old, they have it all roped off. The Bodo Fumero that you saw earlier, the incense thurible, was controlled by ropes that go up to the ceiling of the cathedral, but they were all tied up here. And this is where the eight people would come and get their ropes to uh, swing the Bodo Fumero. So Claire and Patrick were looking very devious, like they were going to untie it and they were going to swing it themselves. And there's a close-up view of the thurible itself. 
and they had a sign up that um, you could not take pictures inside the Apostle. So we all thought, thought that that was a pretty good guideline. Now, Claire, explain what was the Apostle that uh, you were going to go inside? Um, they have like a little canopy thing, and under it they have this famous statue of St. James, and it's tradition that after you walk the Camino, you go inside and you hug St. James. This is actually going down to where a St. James, here it is right here, St. James's bones are. And here, here's another picture of it. And after more time in the cathedral, we went into the shops and shopped for a little bit. Um, and we saw these four girls from Arizona again that we had walked some of the Camino with, so we took a picture with them. As we continued to walk around Santiago, beautiful town. And then that night we went to an Italian restaurant for dinner. And while Patrick and I were walking around, he found some statues and decided to impersonate them. Then the next day we went back again to the cathedral. And we got a really good seat because we were hoping that they would swing the boat of Fumerio again, but they didn't. And then we went outside and you could see a lot of the different statues. This is a great view of uh, the basilica there, cathedral. And here's our family, and here we are, and there's a plaza right there, and we were having lunch there. And at the conclusion of that, it was time for us to head back home to Madrid, our temporary home, while we were in Spain. So this is a view from the train of one of the many different castles that we passed. But it was nice to get back to Madrid as our hub, and then we were ready for our next adventures. So from Madrid, we took the train to Avila, Spain. And here I am looking out at the window at different villages we were passing and countryside. And once we got to Avila, we had to walk through the town to find the tourist center to figure out where everything was. This is so cool. This is actually a picture of two stork nests, and they're just gigantic. They're all over. And Avila is a completely walled medieval city, and the walls are still intact. So it's absolutely spectacular. And once you get to the walls, you can go inside them. And built into the walls is the Avila Cathedral. And this cathedral is really, really ancient, and it's built into the wall, and it's, it's just really amazing. And when we entered, I spotted a statue of St. Peter, so I rubbed his foot, which is like a tradition thing you do in the Vatican. Here's the cathedral. It's just spectacular. It's just gorgeous. And here it is again. And this is the um, paintings over the high altar, and it's just incredible. And just more views around the inside of the altar. And this is a giant monstrance that they have in the treasury there. Claire and I are admiring the um, vestments that the priests would wear. And um, this is us outside of St. Teresa's monastery that she founded there in this is where she lived. This, it was Our Lady of Mount Carmel's feast day, and so this was a statue of her in the church. And this is a sign commemorating a day in 1982 when St. John Paul had come and visited. And this was a little sign commemorating how uh, St. Teresa had had her garden right outside the church, which is shown here where she used to play when she was little. And this is the front of the church where she, uh, that was built over where she used to live. Here's Daddy Claire and I standing in one of the entrances to the wall. And here is us outside of the um, city, looking back at the walled city, and this is actually the spot where her, um, she and her brother ran away because they wanted to go be martyred by the Moors, and her uncle found them right on the spot where the pillars are and stopped them and brought them back home. And these are the walls of Avila. It's one of the only completely walled cities um, left from medieval times. And this is the Monastery of the Incarnation, which is actually outside the monastery walls. And it's where St. Teresa first entered the Carmelite convent, and she lived there for almost 29 years of her life. And inside of it, they have a chair that Pope John Paul had sat in when he visited. And she had a vision on this staircase of baby Jesus. And you can actually see there, it's taken through the reflection of the glass there, but you can see a statue of... St. Teresa, but also in the reflection part, you can see the little statue of Jesus where she had her vision. 
This is a, a painting that hung in her house as a little girl, and it's a painting from the biblical um, story of the woman at the well, and she was very inspired and moved by this painting. And this was a crucifix that had really moved St. Teresa as well when she was in the convent. And this is a wall of relics um, from her. More beautiful vestments. This was the cell where she lived when she was the prioress at the Incarnation. I love this because this is where St. John of the Cross would hear the confessions of St. Teresa of Avila and the other sisters in the monastery. And they have a little chapel off to the side commemorating um, St. Teresa's life. Then it was back outside and we went back by the cathedral again and then it was time to go up on the walls. And here is Mommy Clara and I looking down at the city of Avila spread out below and walking on the walls and passing cathedrals and just looking all around and taking pictures. It was a really beautiful view and you can see there the cathedral in the background where it's built into the walls and you can see the buttresses, the flying buttresses that are holding up the cathedral because if the cathedral walls weren't strong enough then that part of the wall wouldn't have been strong enough to defend the city. This was the St. Joseph Monastery that was the first monastery that St. Teresa founded. And we boarded a train and headed back to Madrid while eating pastries that we had bought in Avila. And that was the end of that day, preparing us for the next adventure. So um, this is Toledo, Spain. And here we are at the train station. It was very, very hot this day. And here Claire and Patrick. And the, it's a medieval city. It's a gorgeous city. And they're walking into the city. Here's one of the gates to the city. And they have a street that is um, a reminder of their sister city, which is Toledo in Ohio. And again, it's just a very beautiful Spanish city. And as we walk through the town, we were able to see up ahead the cathedral. This is part of the cathedral. Uh, this cathedral is known as one of the most spectacular, one of the most beautiful cathedrals in all of Europe. And here am I standing next to um, a knight's armor in a um, shop where we went to the bathroom. <laughs> this is inside the cathedral. And this is the pictures, like the paintings and the statues over the altar in the cathedral there. And there's Claire and Patrick looking through the gating and the, uh, looking over towards the high altar. This was really incredible. Um, they actually, there was a hole in here and they actually painted over the hole and the light just streamed in and it was just, it was really neat. It was a hole in the ceiling, ceiling and they had yeah. let the light then illuminate all the sculptures down below. Mm -hmm. This is the ceiling in the sacristy there and it also has an El Greco um, on the wall there. There were actually multiple El Grecos. That was the big prominent one on the one end there of the disrobing of Jesus. But you can see there's art everywhere. Yeah, this sacristy is considered a mini Prado because um, there's so many El Grecos and other famous artists too. It's, it's just, it's incredible, it really is. And this was the monstrance there, which was even bigger than the one we had seen in Avila. <laughs> and then this was the Chapel of St. Blaise, is that correct, Claire? Yes. And we figured that you were sitting in the corner maybe because you had misbehaved since you hadn't finished painting the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we went into the treasury there where that monstrance was and there were all kinds of priceless works of art. And this was just one of those. So this was a cross and you can see there's a mirror behind it. This was actually a gift that was given by um, Mussolini to Franco. Um, Fra Angelico actually made this cross. So on one side, the reason why the mirror is there is because on one side, Christ is alive, but then the mirror shows that on the other side that he painted Christ uh, as dead on the cross. Um, and so here's all these priceless works of art. And things, mm, investments. And right, and priceless pieces of art by famous artists. And right next to all of this was this. And this was the gift from the city of Toledo, Ohio, the sister city to Toledo, and Spain. Wasn't that impressive? It wasn't no. that pretty. No. So to our friends in Toledo, Ohio, you might want to try to get them a nicer gift. <laughs> 
This is one of the streets in Toledo, Spain. Just another gorgeous street. And here we are at, here uh, my food is at lunch. And as <laughs> I said earlier, I got meat and cheeses at like every meal and just ate um, sausages and salamis. So Nutella is one of my favorite foods. So when I saw this in a gelato shop in Toledo, I was very, very excited. Well, throughout this time, Margaret had been reading in all these tourism books that you know there were different places to go and blogs and web pages. One of the things it said was to go down to this one bridge where you get the most spectacular view of the city. So we walked an extremely long distance in the sun, and it was really, really hot. And when we get to the bridge, this was the view. So we were all a little disappointed that we had it's walked still that pretty. far. It sure. was, but we had walked a long way for this view. Minutes. So <laughs> we were a little disappointed. I love this picture of the kids. They're just so cute. And here they are walking through the streets of Toledo. <laughs> this is so great. This was in a souvenir shop, uh, this bull. And so Patrick was acting like he was scared of it. It was wonderful. It's a dead bull. Yeah. It, it is a dead bull. Really but it was alive. also kind of timely because right while we were in Spain, the running of the bulls happened. And so we had just seen earlier the day or two before this video footage of some of the uh, happenings at the running of the bulls. So Patrick was almost recreating that. Here we are with the statue of Don Quixote. And um, here is a shop, all these swords. And Toledo is famous for all their swords they make. And the best bullfighters in Spain come here to get their swords done. The Marines get some of their swords done here. And um, in The Hobbit and Lord of the Ring movies, they got all their swords made in Toledo, Spain. This was really neat. The, the Toledo is also known not only for its swords, but for its jewelry. It's like an inlaid silver, inlaid gold. And so you can actually go and watch uh, some of the people there make this jewelry by hand. It's, it's really beautiful. And this was another gorgeous church that was somewhere in Toledo. And then we also passed the Convent of St. Clair. So I got a picture with the sign. And here's a sign saying Hobbit because it's some of those swords that were made in Toledo that were used for the Hobbit. And again, gorgeous walls outside the city. And as we headed back towards the train station, we stopped and another tourist there took a picture of us looking back a little bit and down the river. And then it was time to get on the train and head back to Madrid to get ready for our next big adventure as we left Spain. We... Um, drove to the airport in Madrid, and here I am in the airport, standing next to the um, gateway entrance, and it says up above me, it says Marrakesh, and we were getting on a plane to go to Marrakesh, and here I am on the plane looking out the window, and as you can see in this picture, um, it's a straight of Gibraltar, and on the left is Morocco, and on the right corner, top corner, is Spain, so they're quite close. So this is the airport in Marrakesh, Morocco. It's extremely hot. We're so excited to be in North Africa. And we um, got a car ride to the edge of the city, but um, walled city, but since you can't drive in it, so we then um, got out of the car in this bustling little square, and the man standing behind Claire, Abdullah, took us to our Riyadh. And this is us at our Riyadh with the little oriental dipping pool in the background, which was freezing cold. And Pat all the hotels there have little courtyards in the middle of them. Patrick, can you explain what a Riyadh is? A Riyadh is? is like an old house converted into a hotel. And it has a courtyard in the middle, usually with a fountain or a pool. It has a flat roof, a terrace. And all the houses in uh, Marrakesh, Morocco, and in Morocco in general, they're all built around courtyards and have flat roofs. This is a little alleyway right near our Riyadh in Marrakesh. And here I am, very excited to be in Morocco, and this is in the square called Jema El Fana, and it's the main square in Marrakesh where much of their daily life revolves around. And so we went in and we started exploring the square with all of its little markets. And we needed to take a quick break, so we went upstairs to the top of a restaurant to get a cold drink to cool us off on that hot day. 
and had this beautiful view looking down at parts of the Gemma El Fena and you could see mosques in the distance. You can see uh, all the vendors there. And while that square, particularly back to the upper left in this picture, was fairly open at this time, at night that area would just come alive and be filled with all kinds of food carts. So here's Margaret and Claire and Patrick, my three favorite people, just looking beautiful, uh, a little bit hot, as we uh, look out over the big square Gemma El Fena. And after we stopped, we got some watermelon, and it was pretty much the best watermelon I've ever had in my life. Um, and here we are in the souks, which are the covered marketplaces. And um, my mom's looking at some, I don't know if it's clothing or what. And as we walk through the souks, we pass the olive souks, where tons of different kinds of olives were being sold. sold. And we walked through the chicken souk, which smelled really bad, and people were cutting off chickens' heads and putting them in bags and bringing them home, I guess. And there was lots of colorful pottery and baskets and hats for sale. So here we are walking um, out of the souks. Um, and this is really funny because we pass this little cafe and it says Dallas. And I'm sitting there going, hmm, this doesn't look like Dallas. <laughs> so here's me just looking around the square in Morocco. And then we headed back to Gemma El Fana to see all the sites. And there were all kinds of different people, not only selling things, but also doing different things. And we found numerous different snake charmers there in the square. And so that is a real live cobra. And then the snake that is around my neck in that picture is a water snake. That it was not a poisonous snake. But uh, some of the people there were willing to grab my camera for a whole bunch of Duraham, which is their currency, and take pictures of our family with the snakes. So here we all are with the non-poisonous snake. And the guy went around and put it on all of our necks. And here I am with it around my neck and I was kind of freaked out. Just, I don't know. So here is a cobra right near us. In fact, at one point, David was just extremely close to this and I was a little freaked out. And they had some other poisonous snakes there as well that were a little bit intimidating looking. Um, and here we are walking through the streets of Marrakesh to get back to our Riyadh. And we ate dinner that night at our Riyadh. It had, like, I guess they served dinner there. And we had couscous and tagine, which is this, um, it's named after the kind of clay. Well, I don't know if it's clay, but the kind of pot it's cooked in. And um, it's all these seasonings and sauces and chicken and vegetables and potatoes and all kinds of things in it. It's excellent. And here we are, we went um, at nighttime back to Gemma El Fina, and it was a lot more crowded. And um, there was lots of food stalls and, yes. And we walked through the food stalls and we were just really entertained by all the men who were selling the food there. And what were some of the kinds of things they would say to us, Margaret? They would say things like, finger licking good. <laughs> Kentucky fried chicken. And then they would say also things like to David, um, too thin. <laughs> you need food. You, you need food. Like, you need food. Need food. <laughs> and here is their main mosque in Marrakesh. It's called the Ketubia Mosque. And when was that built? It was built in the, it's either the 1100s or the 1200s. So that here are Patrick and I, and we are uh, getting our feet in this cold water because it was so warm. It felt very refresh refreshing. And the next morning, they brought us breakfast up on the terrace, and it was these interesting little spice cakes with these Moroccan tortillas. And then we decided to go out for a walk through the souks. And I almost ran into this large piece of meat hanging from <laughs> an awning. And we walked through the souks and purchased some things. And um, here are Claire and I in the souks. Of and there was a little kitten running around, so we had to get a picture of that. And there were cats everywhere in Marrakesh. Yeah, there were. Most of them were pretty scrawny and didn't look all that healthy. So here we are uh, in the marketplace. It was very fun. And I got a pair of slippers, leather slippers called babooches. So here I am trying them on in the shop. And not everyone, but a lot of people, especially men, wear these in Morocco. This was a much needed break out of the hot sun. We're overlooking the Gemma Alfina. Here it is again during the day. 
This is inside the courtyard at our Riyadh, and looking up, you can see Patrick and I. And here we are walking down the street, which our alleyway where our Riyadh was located off of. And that night we went to dinner at Dar es Salaam, where the Alfred Hitchcock's movie, The Man Who Knew Too Much, was filmed. And they went to this restaurant in the film. And so we went there, and there was a woman balancing candles on her head, and she was twirling around. And Very traditional Moroccan restaurant, and we had a very, very nice meal there. And then afterwards, when we went outside, there was a pretty fountain outside. And the next morning, it was Sunday, so we went to Mass at the Catholic Church in Marrakesh called Holy Martyrs. And it was mostly um, African people from like Central Africa and then some French and other European people. And they had a little bulletin board up there with the history of the Church of Morocco in French. And um, here's the outside of the Church of the Holy Martyrs. And then we headed to the um, Margelle Gardens, which was a um, garden that this man, Jacques Margelle, owned. And he, when he, I think, died, or he sold it to Yves Saint Laurent, who lived in it for a while. And now it's a very nice garden. And it was a Sunday, so we sure enjoyed the shade and being in a place where we weren't uh, in the direct sunlight the entire day. Yes, this was a very a restful day, and there's a barrel cactus Patrick's very intrigued with. <laughs> there's all kinds of cactus there. It was pretty amazing. And then David was being artistic. I really like this picture of my sweet girl. Oh, my sweet girl. <laughs> sweet and girl. here's Patrick and I outside of one of the little buildings there, and we're all looking at some really tall cactus and uh, palm trees and... All sorts of stuff. And after we went to the Jardin Margelle, um, the Margelle Gardens, we went back into the souks. My mom, my dad, and I, and Claire stayed at the Riyadh. And um, here is us in Rabba Kadima, which is a little square. Not as big as Jima El Fana, but it's still bustling. And, and here is a doorway, um, a door in an alleyway in Marrakesh. And all the doors were very nice there. And that evening we went to a restaurant called Cozy Bar which is this little balcony overlooking a little square there in Marrakesh. And notice Patrick's, uh, Patrick's wearing his Aggie shirt. And then here's the sun setting from the Cozy Bar, the view of it was just gorgeous, as you can see. And also from the Cozy Bar, you can see many storks with their nests there. It was so cool. And there's my beautiful bride looking out over the city. It was a beautiful view from up there. And as the sun set, you could see the lights coming on. It was truly magnificent. And here are the kids at the Cozy Bar. And here's David being artistic. This was a really cool light. The next day, we headed out pretty early outside of Marrakesh into the little villages in the countryside where the Berbers, who are the indigenous people of Morocco who lived there before the Arabs came, and we, um, where they lived, and we went to their villages. And those villages are in the base of the Atlas Mountains, yes. which are the highest mountain range in northern Africa. This is a really cool olive tree that we found shade under in the hot sun. And here we are walking past some prickly pear cactus and through a little village. And we went into a house, and this is the courtyard in the middle of the house. And there's the courtyard again. And then... Um, we went into a room and we drank tea with the family and ate bread and olive oil and honey with the family. And the specialty in Morocco is mint tea, so we all drink mint tea. Here we are. This actually, this olive oil was some of the best olive oil I've ever had. It was really, this was delicious. So we're in their home, sitting on the floor. And here are Claire and Patrick in this wonderful family's home. And here we are. Uh, this uh, man and woman um, had uh, many children. Ten. 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 children. So we got to take a picture of them. They were very hospitable. And as we headed out to the next town, our guide asked who wants to ride the donkey. So I stepped up and got on the donkey and rode her all the way to the next town. So we um, walked and Claire rode through villages or through a village and passed through the countryside, past a rather large lizard. 
And then I got on the donkey with Claire. And we kept on riding through the mountains. And I was a little nervous <laughs> seeing them on this donkey, especially as they're going down, you know, when we start to go downhill, like right here. So Claire is, here she is on the donkey, and we're about to go into another little village. So while we were riding through the mountains, um, I had to go some, down some really, really steep hills on the donkey. And we kept riding and kept going for like an hour through the burning hot sun. And here we are with Claire in the back on our donkey, and we're entering a village where we were going to eat lunch. So here we are going down a steep hill. And I had to go down another hill, and then we finally got to this little town, and I got off the donkey, whom we named Ponchito. Oh, and the donkey didn't have a name, so they allowed us right. to call him Ponchito. Yes, Ponchito. And here is um, a roof of their shrine. They had a Muslim saint buried there and they had a festival every year there and it was the little village, very small. And here we are, um, here I am pouring tea, mint tea, and they would pour it high up. And I learned how to pour it too. And then this uh, meal right here that the really uh, wonderful family prepared for us, this meal was one of the best meals we had in Morocco. This is a tangine which Patrick talked about earlier. It was delicious. Yeah, in addition to the tagine, we had some other foods there. And with the tagine here was chicken and potato and vegetables. And you can see behind it, there's a, a bread, a flat bread. And you'd tear pieces off and dip it in and eat the food. And then since you had the hot food, you needed something cold. So they gave us that juice, which was cold orange and cucumber juice. Rather interesting combination. And here we are enjoying our very good meal. And then we headed back out towards the car so we could drive back through the mountains, past this little town, and back to Marrakesh. And here is a cat we passed that evening in Marrakesh. And it has, if you can see, it's a little kitten. And Claire was like, what is it? Is that a rat it has? And they were like, no, it's a kitten. And here we are, uh, Patrick, with my sweet son. I really enjoyed this picture. This was a beautiful restaurant that we ate at that night. It's called Le Marrakesh. Yes. And afterwards, we went to our favorite place in Marrakesh, which was our little ice cream store that we went to every day, and we got ice cream. Ice Legend. Yes, and it was very inexpensive, and it was very, very good. And that was our final yeah. night in Marrakesh, and then it was time to say goodbye to Morocco. And on our way back home, we had a layover in Lisbon, Portugal that was overnight. So we left the airport and we explored Lisbon. And this is a or square that they have there right on the ocean. And they have some bridges and just it's a gorgeous coast and it felt so nice outside. So this is Lisbon. It's, I think of it as basically a European San Francisco. It's absolutely spectacular. The weather's perfect. It's all hills. You can see a bridge that looks very much like the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And here is um, a church there that we saw and we thought it was pretty. And here we are walking through the streets of Lisbon. And up on the hill you can see a castle, very, very pretty. And we stopped at this really pretty water fountain in the middle of one of their many squares. And we asked a group of people to take a picture of us there. And we ate dinner that night at actually an Italian restaurant, but it had Portuguese food too. But um, and it was very good and yeah. <laughs> then it was time to head back to our hotel and get a few hours of sleep before we headed out the early next morning. And when we went to the airport, we went through the duty-free shop and saw the largest Toblerone bar we have ever seen. And that was the end of our trip. And then from there, we went back home to America.